Yeah, welcome everybody. Thanks for showing up this early in the morning, first talk of the day. Um, my name is Matthias Nieff. I work for Callcentric, which is an IT company, consulting company in uh, Germany. Um, and I will talk about data stream processing, about concepts and a few words on implementation and framework of those concepts. So just a short overview about what I'm going to talk about. So basic ideas, why is stream processing important? What is data stream processing? Um, then some typical problems you encounter when you're doing stream processing. Uh, going over to streaming frameworks and then ha taking a look at current innovations, what is uh, going on in the field of stream processing. And at the end, giving some hints, recommendations, if you think about using some of the frameworks which might help you, which might not best fit. Yeah. So the basic ideas of, of stream processing. So a lot of times if you do stream processing and not in the, maybe in a more older business like insurance or finance, it's basically you have some dump of data, some database with data. You do some batch processing on it, maybe on a nightly basis, quant triggered, uh, writing the results somewhere else, um, reading the results again, doing some analysis. And at the end you have a uh, serving layer giving you the, maybe in web UI and REST API or whatever, giving you the results you calculated earlier in the night. So basically it's a nightly or even hour, maybe hourly or six hourly t uh, triggered batch processing. And after a certain time they say, okay, that's not all we can do. Maybe just process, it, process the data right when it arrives. Um, also store it in the database and the serving layer makes sure it actually always gets the newest data the data from the uh, speed layer above might not be the correct one, might be a little bit, uh, um, and might be an estimation, um, and so on. So, so the uh, layer down here was called the batch layer, and the layer up here is the uh, speed layer, and most of you maybe know this as the lambda architecture, so having a batch layer, having a speed layer for processing. Um, this was basically because it was like, if you do streaming, the streaming results won't be correct at all. That was the main reason why we had this, this uh, differentiation of two layers. So, but with the rise of streaming data, and we have a lot of sources for streaming data, if you think about where is streaming data, actually every data is kind of streaming data. Changing entities, you can make it as a stream because you have a uh, creation of an entity like a customer, you have an update on the customer because the address changes, then you have a creation of a contract, uh, whatever. So this could all be done as a stream. But they're more natural things like streaming data. One of the most uh, popular cases is of course IoT data. So all the stuff coming from temperatures, humidity, from, from machines in industrial um, use cases. Um, but there's also like click streams if you want to uh, track your user on the website, maybe having an online shop, uh, shop or whatever. Um, you do monitoring of monitoring data, of, that's more like technical data, having uh, monitoring your sy systems. Um, Online gaming is pretty famous uh, with streaming data. You maybe know King, which is an, uh, a company uh, producing games for Facebook. I'm not sure I might think that the Candy Crush Saga is from, from King. Um, they are actually using stream processing to track uh, user interactions in their games and to, uh, uh, to improve the user experience. Then, so subsidiary maybe of IoT sensor data, it's automotive data um, with all the uh, um, vehicle tracking stuff with uh, predictive maintenance also in, in, the, uh, in automotive uh, with routing information. And last but not least, financial transactions are also uh, quite interesting for streaming data because you have a lot of incoming transactions which is nothing else than a stream. Uh, and with current technologies you can even do like have the exactly one semantics and all the requirements you need for um, transactional processing. So all these Sources for streaming data and the not so well fitted uh, model of a lambda architecture leads us to the uh, distributed stream processing. And if we talk about distributed stream processing, we basically talk about um, an endless and continuous stream of data. So we don't have a defined end, we don't have a defined beginning. Like if you have batch processing in the night, you can have like, I start here, um, stop here, this is the amount of data I have to process. If anything fails, I can just retry this part of data. I know all the data I need is inside this batch. 
Um, so that makes it easier to, uh, to reason about processing. But here we deal with endless data. We don't know if there's already an end. There might always be coming data. Um, furthermore, we want to have the result earlier. We don't want to wait until the next day. All the time you see, an, if you're a customer and using an internet application, and see like, okay, thanks for your registration, uh, you will get your details tomorrow because we're doing nightly batches. In my opinion, I think like, why should I wait for one for for maybe 12 hours just to get some information which can be calculated right now? So we have a need for speed and real time. Real time can be defined as uh, a few seconds, but real time can only be, can also be like uh, milliseconds, which is not the best case for all these streaming frameworks, or could be a few minutes, but it's not hours. Um, and because the amount of data is too increasing. Furthermore, we need to have the uh, ability to scale. And we do this by uh, horizontal scaling, so by distributing the processing over multiple nodes, not having to scale, um, scale up one single node, but to distribute it over multiple nodes. So in the first step, when we come to stream processing, there was a framework called Spark. You may have heard of it. I will talk about it later. And there was, this, this was actually a batch processing framework. And they think about, hey, we need to do stream processing. And what they do is actually, they called it micro-batching. They said, OK, just have very small batches, like half a second or a little bit longer, and just process one of the small batches after another. And this is streaming. So this was the first thing. Um, they did with, with streaming, which was micro-batching. Um, why was it a good thing in the first step? Because you still have batch semantics. If you want to rerun, or if some of the micro-batches failed, you could easily rerun this. It was just like batching. You could always think like batching. All the data you had in this batch was the complete data. Um, so this was the first step. But um, it further evolved, so we came back to native streaming. Um, so every event is processed at the moment it arrives at the system. We don't batch it anymore. So if you do batching and have batches of 10 seconds, you will actually have a latency of 10 seconds because if the day event arrives 10 seconds later, the batch is completed, it will be processed. This one actually makes sure you don't actually have um, latency, but you can process this on the ongoing as the data comes in. But coming to native streaming, um, there are a few very typical problems you will encounter if you do stream processing. Um, and the most of the problems are related to either time, uh, when does an event occur and when is, it obs uh, uh, when is it observed by the system, and order. So if an event comes in, um, were there events before that did not have, which have not been seen by the system? Or is, it, uh, or is there some other events missing or whatever? And this is basically the problem of event time versus processing time. Um, the event time is the time when an event actually occurs. So if I'm on the mobile phone and playing some, some mobile game like Candy Crush, and I do like push a button and make some things, I don't know what Candy Crush is all about, I just know the name, so uh, I cannot guarantee detail. Um, so if you do something on Candy Crush, um, this is the time when the event occurs, which is actually the event time. The perfect thing would be the event occurs and at the same time it's seen by the backend, by the system. This would be like this case. Um, event occurs a few sec uh, in the same moment it is seen by the system. Most of the time this is not possible. So most of the time it's a little bit, at least a little bit delayed uh, or a little bit further delayed. Um, then the next one is again a little bit uh, later on, but it could also be like there's an event and another event is seen and for some reason the event is really, really late and also out of order. Uh, one good example is, for instance, uh, if you take an intercontinental flight, 10, 12 hours, uh, everybody's switching on their mobile phone, everybody was playing uh, Candy Crush during the flight, uh, and 12 hours later a lot of events coming back to the Candy Crush server. Um, so this is actually a thing you might have to consider if you do uh, stream processing. So one thing, if you do stream processing, is you slice the data into chunks, into chunks you can actually reason about. It's a little bit like batching, but it's not on the uh, strictly t uh, processing time. If you do micro-batching, it's like 
10 seconds passed in my system, so I slice here. It's more about slicing on the event time, for instance. Uh, it could not, also, not only be made on the event time, it can also be made on the uh, um, uh, amount of events occurred, this is a count, or it couldn't be based on the content. For instance, if I have a few events and then there's a logout event, if I uh, track a user in a web store, then there's a logout event, um, which might actually end the window because I want all the events which happened during his session when he was logged in. And there are a few kinds of windows. There's tumbling window, sliding window, session window. Um, we'll just go over them uh, in a few words. So this is the tumbling window, which is actually the easiest window. Um, above there are the uh, stream, four, five, three, six, and so on. Um, we can assume there's one event uh, every second, and we have a window size of four seconds, and we just split them into windows of a length of four seconds. Pretty easy. And it's tumbling because um, it just folds over, it tumbles over, it's, there's no overlapping, nothing. Um, and on the window we do an, uh, a pretty easy function in this case, just doing a uh, sum aggregation and that's it. So, and the sliding window is a little bit different, not that much. Um, we still have a window size of four seconds, but we have now a sliding interval of two seconds. So we're moving the window not every four seconds, for four seconds, but we're moving the four seconds window every two seconds. And so we have overlapping windows. So this was the four seconds here, and two seconds later we start another four second window and we have an overlapping here. So this is, if you're doing a sliding average over a stream, this is what you want to do with the sliding window. And there's the uh, session window. So this is key, so we, you take the stream, say, okay, I take every element by some key, as, for instance, a an user in this case, um, and if a certain amount of time, like here, has passed, I will say, okay, all the events before this are one window, and then I will start another window. But there's also some very small here. So in this case, the uh, window was not triggered by the amount of time between some events, but it was triggered by a logout event over here. So this is an actually a, not a time trigger for a window, but a content trigger. Uh, but what happens now, we have, we have all this window and then we have some delayed event coming in because of some network partition or whatever, so we have a, net, a delayed event coming in here. And now the, all we have to reason about is what does the event mean for us? Because in this reason it means, in this case it means we have to merge those windows. The time span is not long enough. Uh, we have actually treated this as one window. Um, so this is also something we have to think about. Good news, the streaming frameworks that we'll talk about later take, uh, take care of these things. So in recap, when time, processing time is pretty important if it comes to um, stream processing. And this combined with windows, with, uh, uh, with triggers, is actually um, one of the most important challenges we have in stream processing. And one of the solutions of the, for this challenge is the data flow model. Uh, the data flow model was uh, is originated at Google. Um, there was uh, Tyler Akidar, is the, one of the main authors, there are a few more. Um, they actually built a system which is Google Cloud Dataflow now, it's an on-premise, uh, 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 it's a, not an on-premise, it's a cloud solution um, for doing data stream processing. Um, and the main thing is, uh, what he said is, uh, we have to stop trying to groom unbounded data sets into finite pools, which is exactly what micro-batching does, um, that eventually become complete, we don't know if they come complete, uh, but we instead to live and breathe on the assumption that we'll never know if or when we have seen all of our data. We don't know if there's some late data. The only thing we can do is we have to balance between correctness. If we want, we, we can, can actually wait for all data, for all time. It's just the meaning of res resources. We have a lot of memory, we have we a lot of storage to uh, cache all the data. Um, so it's a balance between correctness, between latency, when do I get my results, how long do I wait, and cost for resources. Um, and they made some pretty good, uh, have some pretty good ideas uh, how to handle this. And the first thing is the watermark. Um, the watermark describes um, 
when will I res uh, calculate my results? So when do I assume I have seen all my data? Um, and so and if you have, if this stream reached a watermark of 10, 10 o'clock, then I, that means I assume all the data until 10 o'clock has been seen by my system. Um, just to make it a little bit uh, easier to understand the small graph. So this would be the ideal way. Um, one second pass in event time, one second pass in processing time. We see all the events right at the point when it occurs in event time. Normally it's more like this. There's a little bit of skew in between. Uh, events will be delayed. The easiest way to say, okay, we have a fixed watermark of maybe we wait three seconds and after this, uh, we assume everything is there. This would be like this one here. Um, we, see, uh, we see all the events in between. Uh, we, we, we have seen all the events. Uh, we have a delay of three seconds. Everything is fine. But there are also some gaps in between where the delay is actually one second would be enough. This is more like a heuristic watermark. Uh, this is the yellow line now. So. Um, you see in the, in the uh, beginning, everything is fine, and then the heuristic watermark is a little bit too slow. The events coming later, so we uh, correct the watermark, increasing it a little bit, and adapting to the actually incoming curve. So coming back to this one, here we have an, uh, at the event time of three, um, we see the data at the processing time of six, so we have a three seconds delay, but we see all the data. No data is missing. Uh, with the Heuristic watermark, we see uh, we have a delay of one and a half seconds only, but we might miss some events. So this is the first thing of one, do I actually calculate my results, which is the watermark. The second part is a trigger. Besides having the watermark, we can have other ideas when to, or other things when we want to trigger the result. I already talked about the event time, I already talked about count, the content, for instance, if the lockout event has occurred, you can combine those. So this, is, uh, this could actually be like every 10 minutes in processing time. So if I do a one hour window, I can calculate after 10, after 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes after the watermark. Um, then when the watermark is reached with each delayed event, and also, but also for another 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, I would just break up and say, okay, those events are too late, uh, they don't, I don't have any benefit if from processing those events. But if you do a few more triggers, you will get an individual result every time. You get a result after 10 minutes, you get a result after 20, after 30, and so on. And now is the question, what are we doing with those separate results? We have to combine them in some way. Um, and this is what accumulators are for. So. Um, there are three types of accumulators defined. Uh, the one is discarding, so I just care about for every partial result. I don't care for the whole result. Then there's accumulating, taking the former result into account, adding, as, adding this to the new result, and then accumulating, retracting, saying, okay, this is a new one, it's accumulating, but this one was the previous one. So if you want to correct it in your downstream system, this is the old one. Just to make it a little bit easier to understand, we have a stream again, a very small part of the stream right now. Um, the, first is, the first figure is here after the two. Um, the result is 777 seven, seven in all cases. Um, then the uh, next event are 8 and 3, so 11 would be added. Discarding just gives us the 11, because this, this, this is the result of the last computation. Accumulating gives us the, uh, the 18, because 7 and 11 is 18. And accumulating detecting says, OK, the new result is 18, but the former result was 7, and so on. Um, so this is actually important depending on your downstream system. If you have a system downstream which just overrides the result, maybe because of an idempotent operation, um, the accumulating um, accumulation is just fine. If you need all the different results because you need to make different uh, uh, calculations with it or the system uh, underneath cannot be easily updated, then maybe discarding is an important one. So this is all the theory. We have watermarks and triggers to describe when we want to calculate the result, and we have the um, accumulators to handle the different results. Putting this all together, um, the uh, cloud data, Google Cloud Dataflow guys actually built a pretty good API to express this.
Um, so if you take this, the input is this stream. The first thing they describe is, okay, we want to do a window of a fixed size. Um, nothing else is given, so this is actually a tumbling window with a size of 60 minutes. Um, triggering describes when we want to trigger the result at watermark and also with the early firings, early meaning before the watermark, uh, every 10 minutes, and with late firings after the watermark every time a new event comes in. But I will only wait for 50 minutes, which is the allowed lateness. After this, all the events I will just drop and ignore. And I have a discarding uh, accumulator, so I just get the partial results of every calculation. And I think this is a pretty good uh, way to express this, um, this way of, of um, how to handle the stream in regards of uh, late data. So this was actually a pretty huge one. There's another option. And this is, can actually be presented in one slide. So the data flow model is one thing, then there's the model of streams and tables. Um, so this is not that complex model, it's a pretty easy model. Um, it's propagated by uh, Confluent, the uh, company behind Kafka right now, a little bit uh, more. Um, so it basically says, okay, you can treat every stream also as a table and the other way around. So if you just take this one, this is stream coming in, two values coming in, and this could also be meant as a, as a table with a key and a value. Another thing coming in from the stream, um, just add it to the table. And another value on the stream, this one again with key one, just updates the table in this case. You can think of it, uh, every relational database uses this technique because it's a change log in the database, which is basically the same as this one here. Um, so and they just say, okay, if I do stream processing, I would just treat every incoming event, updating my result, my result table. Um, doing this, you can actually improve it a little bit, not for every event because that would be too much. Um, and I have a threshold, just a normal threshold. After 15 minutes, I forget everything. So in a lot of use cases, this is totally fine to use but it's basically a subset of functionality of the uh, data flow model. So and if you're planning about a stream, uh, stream processing application, you have to think about what are my requirements? When do I need results? How often do I need, uh, need, to, need to calculate my results? Do I really need the flexibility of the data flow model, which is really, really good? Or is it fine to just go with the stream and table model? So this is all the thing about order and time, which is maybe the, the most important thing when doing stream processing. But there are a few other things to think about if it comes to stream processing. One of the things is stateful processing. Stateful meaning I've stored something for an immediate time in a temporary storage. Uh, for instance, if I do a, a window, app, window calculation and I have a one hour window, I have to store this data and cache this data for one hour. Um, or I do accounting or whatever. So you, if you do a non-trivial uh, non ap application, you will have some state. Um, this state is actually mostly held in memory because of performance reasons. It's backed up on disk. It can also be only on disk, uh, depending on what size this is. Um, but the interesting things are actually, um, I'm in a distributed world. What am I doing with my state if I uh, repartition my stream? And I don't want to have the state on all my nodes. If I have a state maybe key-based per user ID, I don't want to have all the user IDs stored on every node. So, but I want to make sure that the uh, stream is actually partitioned and divided and put on the right node where also, also the stream resides. But then my data increases. My, my, uh, so I have to rescale. I have to add nodes. I have to rescale my state as well. So this is all the interesting stuff right now. Um, most of the uh, frameworks solve it pretty good, but um, there's, there are differences. Um, so this is the, uh, uh, the main challenges. It's partitioned. It must be fault tolerant. Uh, what if a state? What if, if some node goes down? I don't want to lose the state. Uh, it must. The access must be fast. Um, so there are different storage backends backend used for state. Um, Spark Streaming, for instance, uses a uh, 
native own build uh, state uh, with, uh, with an off heap storage mainly, then Kafka Streams and Flink both use VoxDB um, with, together with uh, uh, Kafka Topics as a backup, for instance. Flink has some uh, snapshotting mechanism. So, and there's one pretty good paper discussing all the challenges like uh, partitioning, spreading out, rescaling, and uh, it's linked about, uh, down there. Um, so, if you're interested in state, implementation and state managing in, in uh, streaming framework, this is actually pretty good. So another thing, next to state, state is mainly built from the data which comes from the stream, but most of the time this, the uh, data inside the stream is not enough. Basically, maybe you only have an ID from some IoT device, but you actually don't know what IoT device it is. Uh, and you have to read some thresholds when I want to Alum something which can be changed, and the threshold can be changed in a web application, and the threshold is then stored in a database. Um, so you have to make lookups onto the database. So we have a queue, data coming in, we process, it, process the data, um, we have to read metadata and store the results somewhere else. One way to do this is to uh, read the metadata from uh, one node, and the, uh, the, uh, the, the data is written to node for processing, and the node doesn't, doesn't remote call, network call, reading the metadata, the same uh, for every event it uh, occurs and which has be, will be processed. So every time uh, the data, so just go here again, um, every time I have to read data, additional data, I will make a network request uh, to, the, uh, to the database, ask the database for the data, um, maybe the database is fast in processing uh, in giving me the data. Maybe the database takes some time, but I will for sure add some latency to this one. Um, this is actually what Spark and Flink do. Flink works on these, uh, works on this, tries to improve this, um, going to the local read. Um, so we have the data coming into the uh, nodes again. Um, the uh, metadata is stored into the uh, in the database, and what we are doing right now is. At the beginning, when we start up the application, we move the data to the nodes, and we also make sure that all changes in the database, in the metadata database, will be propagated to the nodes again. And if you think now about the uh, stream and table model, this is basically just retreating the table we have as a stream, moving the stream over to the nodes again, and basically do a stream join over here. One stream is actually a stream with pretty fast changing data, or the IoT data, whatever, and one stream is a, uh, has data which doesn't change that much, like metadata, more or less static metadata. Um, and in this case, we don't have any latency because we do a local join uh, on the database. Important thing, both streams have to be uh, partitioned in the same way, so we have user IDs, for instance, as partitioned, both must be partitioned in the same way, uh, to make sure all the data resides on the correct node and they match on the same node. So this is actually a uh, table streams model uh, propagated by Kafka, so this is what Kafka Streams actually tries to do. So now we have an application, we can manage time, we can make lookups, we can uh, uh, store, store data in between for a state, but now we have to run it somewhere. Uh, it works fine on our notebook, works on my machine, pretty good, but uh, running some way is also pretty important. So there are two things. This is the uh, one-time environment above left uh, from Flink, and the right side is from Spark. We don't go into details uh, right now, and this is actually what you can do with uh, Kafka Streams. And the difference is, if you use Flink or Spark or whatever, you need a, def a separate cluster manager. You need a master. You need worker nodes where the actual processing uh, is done. You need some resource manager. The resource manager can be Yarn or Mesos in most cases. Um, but we have a cluster infrastructure. And it's a in specialized Kafka infrastructure because the worker is an actual Flink worker or Spark worker. Maybe done with Yarn, but it's an extra hardware for uh, it's extra software for this one. And Kafka Streams is basically just a library. It's a Java file, you add it as a Maven dependency, Gradle dependency, whatever, um, to, your, to your application, and you produce a Java file. And this Java file you can run in whatever you want. You can provision it with Ansible Chef at somewhere, in some location. 
Um, you can put it into Docker containers, run it on Kubernetes, you can run it on Yarn, you can run it in uh, Docker containers on Mesos, whatever you want or wherever you want to run it. Or if, you, if you're using a cloud, you can run it in a cloud using, the, uh, uh, using some platform services. Uh, you're completely free what you want to do. So you have a lot of flexibility. And if you just want it because um, the API is cool, which is not maybe the only reason you should for this to go for distributed stream processing, uh, but you could go for it because it runs fine if you just have one jar, uh, run it somewhere, and you're good to go. And it automatically scales up if you just another at another instance it just uses Kafka consumer mechanisms uh, to rescale. Another important thing: if we run it, we have to monitor it. Um, make sure there is no all-in-one super cool solution for this one. Um, all, the frame, the, all the frameworks have different, way, different ways to monitor this. Um, some have a pretty good UI. Maybe all of them have a REST API, sometimes with a lot of more, with more information, information, sometimes with less information. Um, drop wizard metrics is often used if you want metrics. Um, then there are the Java classics on the other side. Uh, JMX, everybody they are all based on Java, so they all uh, offer some JMX capabilities uh, using a profiler. Uh, you have to monitor your scheduler if you're using, for instance, Kafka Streams. So just move, you move the complexity out of the stream processing, but to the scheduler. Um, you have to do your own logging, you have a distributed logging, and you will log in a distributed environment. So it's, it's not easy. Distributed environment makes it a little bit more complex. So after talking about Running this solution, we will talk about uh, delivery guarantees, which was actually quite interesting at some point because uh, Kafka streams and together with Kafka only supported at least once guarantees. So at most once means I will make sure you get it at least at most once, either in zero or one time. The event you will, will see it at least once means I will make sure I will process the events, but it might happen that I process it at multiple times and not only one time. And exactly once means. Um, I will make sure I will process this event once and only once, not zero, not, zero, not two times. I will process it once. There are a few different techniques um, to acknowledge this, uh, to, to, to achieve this. Um, Victor Klang once uh, had this tweet, which I actually find pretty good. Um, effectively once, meaning that you have at least once um, guarantees and doing idempotent operations. So. Uh, Regardless how often you execute this operation, the result will always be the same as after the first execution. Um, why is this actually a pretty good idea? Um, exactly once is quite challenging, challenging in a distributed environment. Exactly once needs a lot of uh, interaction between nodes, between, uh, between uh, systems and processes. There's a lot of coordination going on, and at least once is much easier if it comes to resources, if, if it comes to latency and uh, performance. So at least once is most of the time pretty good. If you can go with at least once and item potent operations, I would always go for at least once and not strive for exactly once. But not to understand me wrong, there are definitely exactly once use cases where this one is pretty important. And there's a good reason um, Kafka now added uh, exactly once um, uh, capabilities to their solution because um, in finance and insurance companies and so on, exactly once is always pretty good, important. So I already uh, talked a few, uh, mentioned a few streaming frameworks a few times. Um, so a streaming framework is nothing but an execution engine designed for unbounded data sets, which is what Stalaki does. So there's no thing what a um, streaming framework should do besides sending unbounded data sets, and we see, we've seen a lot of things now which, is, which, which are important if you uh, want to handle unbounded data sets. And the first thing I want to talk about is Apache Spark, um, maybe one of the uh, most popular big data projects right now. It was basically batch programming first, then doing micro-batching, uh, adding this as Spark streaming to Spark. Um, this is then Spark streaming, which is, was only the engine taking the stream putting this into batches and then taking the core Spark engine to process the data. Um, Spark streaming is actually pretty widespread. Um, Spark is distributed with every Hadoop distribution. You can get it everywhere. Um, but Spark streaming itself does not support event time. Um, 
window operations are quite limited to the uh, because you always have to stick with micro batch size. You cannot uh, have you always have to be a multiple of the micro batch size. Um, but they work on this right now with Spark structured streaming. Um, one thing is that they unified the API further with the batch processing, which is pretty good. So if you read a j file from JSON, this looks like this. And if you read a stream from Kafka, it's just read stream instead of read. Um, so this is quite, a, quite the same, pretty easy API. Um, they're working on the event time operations. The last time I checked the event time operation with late data was just like, okay, you get your results later. If you have wait for 10 minutes, you get your results 10 minutes later. So there was nothing like triggers or uh, intermediate result or anything like this. But they're still working on this one. They get rid of micro-batching underneath. Um, so pretty good. Then we have um, Apache Flink, uh, a European German project. Um, in Berlin right now, so they started also with, uh, okay, we do stream processing and batch processing. Coming from batch processing is just a special case of stream processing, so the other way around. Um, we have a stream with a limit, uh, with a boundary. Um, they focused much on stream processing, which, was, which is quite good in my opinion. The batch part of Flink is not that important. Um, but the stream processing is pretty good. They do all the event handling stuff. They have watermarks, they have triggers, they have accumulators. Um, there's really low latency, um, so this is actually pretty good if you want to go for um, event time handling. And then there's uh, Apache Kafka Streams. Um, who of you knows Kafka? Maybe most of you, because Kafka is the uh, most important message broker. If, it, if leaves a message broker, it's a lock. It's a lock only, um, but if it comes to stream processing, this is most of the time the source, and then at some point it was like, hey, we are the source of everything, why don't we process the data as well? Um, then there was the Kafka Streams API, which is basically um, a better, a, a not so simple consumer anymore, like the normal Kafka consumer, um, but has some uh, streaming uh, things with it, like the table streams um, um, concept for handling late data. Um, it can only read from Kafka, it can only store to Kafka, um, so if you want to store in a database, you need something else like Kafka Connect, which takes the stream of data and stores it in the table, streams and table again, you see the pattern. Um, and it heavily relies on Kafka. So all the hard stuff of stream processing, like ordering, like partitioning, like scaling, they all do it with Kafka. They all just give it to Kafka, and that's, that's the reason why they have only a single library instead of a whole cluster. So if they say, okay, with Kafka Streams, you only need a library that's only half the truth. The other truth is because you have Kafka as a cluster, handling the hard stuff. What's going on in stream processing right now? A few interesting things. You remember this, this uh, view. This is the uh, state. We have some data coming in, doing something with the date, state, storing something in the date, some aggregation, some window, whatever, and processing, processing again. Um, Normally, you would write it in the database in the uh, downstream system. Um, but why not query the state? We all have all the data in the state. It's distributed, yeah. Um, but that's one thing you can do. So this is uh, known as queryable state, which is a little bit better name than interactive query, what uh, Kafka Streams calls it. Um, so in the, uh, it's still pretty low level in, in the uh, framework. So there's nothing about data lifecycle. What happens when the uh, node goes down? The state is lost. Uh, where I want, to, I want to reload the state, I want to clear the uh, state, whatever. Um, deserialization is an issue, for instance, if you query the state using Flink, you still get bytes, you have to deserialize and serialize yourself. Um, in Kafka Streams, for instance, you have the partition state, uh, and you have to figure out for yourself which node actually I have to query for the state. Uh, so this is still work in progress, but um, could be at some point Really interesting, but I would never, never say that the uh, database would be uh, uh, would be not needed anymore if this is uh, production ready. So there's still a need for the database. Another thing is uh, writing your queries actually as, as SQL. Um, Kafka was uh, pretty big in marketing uh, the last months, promoting their case SQL. Actually, Flink had SQL for a long, long time ago, but not doing so much marketing about this. So um, this is nearly under SQL, a little bit different. Um, if you see here, we create a table S, and then this is the stream. 
uh, doing a group buy and having this is all pretty normal to SQL, but we also add a tumbling window of five seconds. Um, so in this case, we're just counting um, the number of transactions with one credit card uh, in five seconds. If there are multiple transactions, that might, might be an indication for fraud. Pretty easy example, but uh, also pretty easy to write for a lot of people because SQL is pretty widespread. So this was a lot of stuff right now. We talked about the problems. We talked about a little bit about frameworks uh, doing stream processing. Um, I want to give at least some recommendations, some hints when you might think of stream processing. The first recommendation is um, if you have small, uh, just a small data set, don't use it. That's the first thing. Although we are all technologies and like really new technology, um, if you only have like 500 events per second, write something with Java or whatever, with Scala or Akka or whatever, and use this one. Or Kotlin, this is a new one. Sorry, forget this. Um, so, but if you go for distribute, then Spark Streaming might be a new option if you already use Hadoop. Um, if you're familiar with, uh, or already use Spark and batch processing, and if you don't have event time handling. Um, event time handling is maybe something, if you really have hard recurrence from event time handling, I would really think about, nah, maybe Spark is not the best option. Might change in structured streaming, so have an eye on structured streaming. Um, this, they're actually working pretty good on this one. Um, and the good thing on Spark is the community is really, really good. It's, it's pretty huge, um, really helpful. Then Flink, if you need all the f event time stuff, like watermarks, triggers, and so on, um, take a look at Flink. This might be an option. And Kafka streams, if you just want, if you already use Kafka, if you just want to start with maybe small footprint, um, the uh, event time handling which Kafka has, if it's okay for you, if you don't need all the trigger stuff and so on, might be good, then Kafka Streams might actually be a good fit. I try to do a short comparison, uh, especially the differences are mainly between uh, how do I deploy this stuff um, and how good is the event time handling or the other stuff. is they they learning from each other and inspiring each other, which is pretty good. Then just a few words on if you ever encounter this. So Apache Beam is what Google Cloud Dataflow, they, they built all the uh, uh, platform as a service stuff, then they made Apache Beam out of it. Apache Beam is the API having different runners, so you have, can specify the API in Beam with the smallest code snippet we've seen earlier um, and have different runners underneath. For instance, Flink, for instance, Google Cloud Dataflow. Um, it's a kind of abstraction. Then Google Cloud Dataflow, um, the Google product, then there's Apex, which is an uh, only Yarn-based stream processor, then there's Flume. A lot of people say, hey, Flume is also stream processing. In my opinion, it's only log file shipping from getting data, log files into HDFS. And then there's Storm and Heron, and actually Storm is pretty widespread because Storm was the first one. I dismissed it here because if you start right now, I, in my opinion, a lot of people uh, tend to use the other three frameworks, but there's a lot of Storm deployments over there. Uh, the first stream processing framework, um, so you might encounter a little bit of Storm as well. Takeaways, so streaming is not easy. We have event time, we have state, we have deployment, we have lookup, we have the correctness with the delivery guarantees, uh, we have the distributed system. Um, there are basically two concepts which are a little bit different at some point, they match at some point, they defer a little bit. Um, be aware of the monitoring. It's a distributed system and don't use it if you don't have a distributed problem. If you have only a small problem, if you don't want to scale, if you don't have the need to scale, in my opinion, don't use these frameworks, play with them, but um, most of the time a normal Java process will do the same. That's it for me. Thanks for your attention and if you have any questions, so I don't see any. Um, if you have any questions, just come up front to me. Otherwise, or is there some question? Um, 
Spring Cloud data flow is more like uh, if you don't have the really scalable prob uh, scale problem, yeah, it can be scaled, but it doesn't have all the event time handling stuff. Um, Spring Cloud data flow is it's more like a Java library uh, with all the distributed time managing stuff. Ben, thank you.